Hello, everyone. Ryan Rodriguez here again with another episode of Connecting Keel Haulers. Today, we are joined by Kellen Parrish, an IBL graduate from the class of 2013. Kellen, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to share your experiences in your career, as well as your time at Cal Maritime with us. Yeah, no problem. I look forward these days to a chance to wear a collared shirt, so thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, Kellen currently works at, as a senior program officer for the Economic Development and Health at Partners of the Americas based out of Washington, D.C. He has previously worked for the Fishery Incorporated as a teaching assistant at UC Davis, at the Research Innovation Fellowship for Agriculture, and in the Peace Corps. He also has a master's in international agriculture from UC Davis. So, Kellen, um, you've kind of been all over since graduating from Cal Maritime. So, kind of just take us through your journey and how you ended up with the Partners of the Americas. Sure. Um, yeah, thanks for that intro. That actually kind of jogged my memory a little bit. Anyway, so uh, I started, so right out of CMA, like in, in, international business and logistics grad. Um, so I, I had actually gotten a job as a port in, at a port in Venetia. I uh, do working with one of the terminals there as a superintendent. And uh, it just it turned out not to be for me. So I had gotten that job right around the time I had applied to the Peace Corps in my last uh, semester. Uh, Cal Maritime. I graduated mid-year because um, I had brought in some credits from another school I uh, burned a year at. Um, and uh, I just kind of made a decision that, you know, my trajectory could be you know, maritime related or it could be whatever Peace Corps was. Um, so I kind of opted for something uh, a little bit off the beaten path. Uh, I was interested in public service and things like that. Um, and I had been told by several people that I didn't really have the demeanor uh, or uh, persona to be a military officer. Uh, so Peace Corps it was. Uh, yeah, it took a while to get comfortable saying something like that. Anyway, so I joined the Peace Corps right out of Cal Maritime. I think there was uh, between graduating in December and arriving in Guatemala, I think it was four weeks. So I just kind of graduated in Spain. I actually didn't see my Cal Maritime diploma until like 2016. I graduated in 2013 just because I was, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was at home. Um, so I got I got set up to be a, uh, a volunteer with Peace Corps volunteers. Are, they're just referred to as volunteers, even though we get paid, you know, I think about 400 bucks a month. Um, and we, I was a healthy schools volunteer, meaning that my project centered on implementing uh, health uh, and sanitation curriculum in rural elementary school districts. So I lived in a municipality of about 50,000 people or so, but they were spread out over hundreds of square miles. Mm -hmm. So most of the towns I visited had, you know, you know, not access to electricity, you no know, running water, things like that. And my job was to kind of help teachers work, you know, with their curriculum to implement certain public health themes into it. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So that was uh, that was kind of my main. It was a big challenge, uh, considering you know you're you're asking people to do all these things that have to do with uh, sanitary you know practices, and there's no running water. So you have to be creative in how uh, and how you deal with problems like that. Um, and then there were some political issues in the country and uh, in my municipality where I was working. So my official project ended up falling apart. And ended up segueing into uh, municipal waste management programs. Uh, there's a lot of issues with solid waste uh, in in kind of in the developing world writ large, mm -hmm. but also in uh, Guatemala specifically. There's issues with plastic um, and recycling. So uh, we kind of implemented a few projects to at the municipal level to help do trash management, and it ended up just being a, a brigade of people every week after the markets would uh, would clear out, kind of collect and separate organic and solid waste. And we had to, you know, things go to landfills like we do in the United States, but it was organizing, you know, unproductive plastics, things we couldn't recycle, things we couldn't compost into one place, and then starting a municipal composting program uh, over the course of two years that ended up, you know, being some kind of a supplemental thing for farmers who needed to fertilize. So we were redistributing fertilizer to farmers in the end uh, by using kind of org local organic wastes. So on the other side, the other thing I did was I was teaching uh, marine biology courses at a local elementary school, or a local middle school, and we ended up doing a tilapia pond. So that is how I kind of segued into getting interested in marine resource management and okay. aquaculture. Yeah, I was so wondering, I was I was wondering how that how that change happened. Right. Yeah, I was trying to come full circle with it. Um, sorry, that was a little long winded no description worries. of the Peace Corps, but 
a lot of um, what I became, what I was interested in at Cal Maritime, and I think my professors were still, you know, remember me bothering them. You know, I wanted to do all my projects about fisheries or aquaculture, mm -hmm. or marine resources, or oceanography. Um, I think Alex Parker is still there. I remember yep. just He's, yeah. he actually started uh, oceanography major this in in 2020. Right. So yeah, I'm je yeah, I'm jealous. I didn't uh, I didn't start later. I had to do it as a minor. <laughs> but I was, uh, you know, I was as in love with the minor as I was the major. So I was always looking for ways to marry that. Um, so you know, you look at uh, you know trying to reduce uh, global poverty or poverty in communities throughout the world and. You know, it becomes a lot about food production, agricultural value chains. So I was able to kind of merge my intellectual interest in aquaculture, fisheries, marine management, things like that, with global development. And it kind of landed on aquaculture um, and uh, fish farming. So what I realized, I didn't know a dang thing about that, uh, other, other than what I was Googling, um, to help farmers out uh, in Guatemala, which is just, you know, amazing how you know what the power of the internet and the ability to use it gave me such a, an advantage and a leg up and an ability to actually be productive as a Peace Corps volunteer in light of some of the political unrest that was happening. But I realized I didn't know enough that to be comfortable. So once I finished the Peace Corps, I ended up back in graduate school uh, at UC Davis. So I did a program called International Agricultural Development. And uh, most of my coursework was in economic development, microeconomics, and then aquaculture engineering. Uh, so if we want to sit this to the end, I will happily go through how a business student can yeah, get we'll, we'll Yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that in a little bit. Yeah, no, okay. no doubt. Because I was not, I was, you know, the business students are famously not engineering students at Cal Maritime. Yep, and, definitely. Uh, I, yeah, right. And uh, yeah, there's always a little bit of tension between the, uh, uh, you know, those, the, what do you call the MPM grads, the grad students and the other ones. But point is, there's a ability, you can make that transition, uh, mm -hmm. just have to be creative in how you do it if you're interested in it. Um, so I did two years at UC Davis where I paid my tuition as a teaching assistant. So I taught a coursework in development theory. And, and then I also taught a couple classes uh, in uh, kind of like an introduction to the American education system. So I got in kind of a crash course in education, you know, like a two year course in it in mm -hmm. the Peace Corps. So that and I went to UC Davis for that. I was low, I'm a California guy, so I was local, able to pay tuition as a California resident. Um, so my second year of graduate school, I decided I had done enough coursework and was able to wrangle uh, a full-time job at uh, what's called the Fishery Incorporated. And that was a, uh, that's actually an aquaculture farm south of Sacramento, California. So I worked there for the better part of a year. Uh, and I was also working with uh, what's called California Cooperative Extension, which is the land-grant university, which used to be in California, it's UC Davis, uh, funding research uh, in agriculture. And I was dealing with a couple different projects at this large, uh, what is actually a sturgeon farm in, uh, in Sac near Sacramento. So I was working there as kind of a one to gain experience in the aquaculture industry directly, but then also uh, kind of being the liaison between the UC Davis research and extension and the private sector, uh, the yeah. private, and, Agriculture it is just always tied to the extension body in any given state and even in any given country as well. Mm -hmm. So I'll get into that. I describe what I'm doing now, but so it kind of gave me an experience in how one how an aquaculture farm operates, how farmers manage their businesses, and the engineering, chemical, and biological processes that have to go that have to do with uh, you know fish farming, which is uh, fairly it's fairly intensive for that. Um, so then uh, I had all my plans to be uh, a, a fish farmer for the rest of my life. Uh, and then I got engaged. So, <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, so then, and then they said, you know, you got to go and get a, a job and, and do this immediately. <laughs> right. So you make, yeah. So I think, God, I don't want to harp too much on this kind of stuff, but I think <laughs> what I got engaged and uh, again, my, my, I met my current, my fiance in the Peace Corps and she's mm -hmm. a public health professional and okay. her job was calling her to the Washington DC area. So I decided, okay, let's do that. So we are right, we both decided to do that. Went across the went across the, the country, and uh, ended up getting a job working in the international development sector, which it was kind of the other half of my graduate degree. Mm -hmm. um, pretty smooth transition for the most part. Um, and I ended up uh, one. It's funny. The, my first day on the job uh, working in international development, I got a maritime question because they saw my resume. So my actual first job in international development was to find how way how to ship. A, a massive grain dryer 
from Venice, Italy to Kigali, Rwanda. And that was the first puzzle I ever got to work on. And it really was because I was able to, I would say it's on maritime on my, uh, on my resume. And uh, there's not many people in Washington, D.C. sitting around with maritime on their yeah. resume, or at least not ones I met. Mm-hmm. And not ones interning for, uh, you know, international agricultural development. <laughs> yeah. Um, so from there, I moved in. Uh, and so I've been at Partners of the Americas now for about two years. And uh, or a little over two years, uh, and I manage a program called Farmer to Farmer, where is where we provide technical extension support. So uh, technical extension in this particular case is supporting government agriculture. Like every other country is USDA, we tend to, we support them with technical assistance to kind of boost their extension system. So in the U.S., we have a really robust system of agricultural support services based in the universities. Most countries, especially where I work in Latin America and the Caribbean and Myanmar, have uh, federally funded programs. Okay. So their agricultural support extension services come directly from a government uh, institution. So like their USDA, uh, like Guatemala's USDA is going to fund uh, services directly gotcha. as opposed to going through universities. So I, we work to strengthen extension systems throughout the Caribbean, uh, Latin America, and uh, Myanmar now. So I manage that. I manage the data and then I manage the technical sides of those projects. Gotcha. Okay. So, and that was kind of going to be my next question is, is diving yep. into that, into your current role yep. as a senior program officer. Sure. So just maybe a, a little bit more on that of just, uh, you know, how you're building these sure. extensions up and, and connecting resources, so on and yeah. so forth. Yeah, sure thing. So part of, uh, part of what I do is, uh, so the farmer to farmer program is unique in that uh, it's a, it's funded by the U.S. Agency for Natural Development. So I will define it, and now I will continue to use the acronym USAID or USAID. Yep. Just mm-hmm. to, I have to define it. First. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. <laughs> just so everyone watching this, like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah. Okay. So USAID uh, funds this project called Farmer to Farmer, and it is a project. It's a five-year project that happens periodically, in which uh, NGOs are apply for these grants basically or multi-million dollar grants we apply for them it's just it's given on a competitive basis and um, we are allowed to implement projects uh, in six countries right now so and those are all i won't list them all but it's central america caribbean Myanmar. (laughs) what we do is we we have on the ground staff in each country so there's a country office uh for our program in each of these in each of these in each country and uh i work with the staff on the ground there and they're going around literally to different agricultural cooperatives farmer groups agribusinesses things like that and asking if there's any kind of technical support that they need typically it doesn't come free when you pay a consultant for anything uh and that includes agricultural and agribusiness so what we do is we tend to we foot the bill and provide technical expertise that comes directly from the United States. So say a professor of, you know, who'd we send down? We sent a, recently we sent a, uh, someone who was a specialist in hogs and pig rearing and pig sanitation, things like that. We had an organization in the Dominican Republic that was having this high, high mortality rate for pigs. And we kind of diagnosed their situation, found an expert just off LinkedIn, how we do it. And then we pay for them to go down there for okay. uh, about two and a half weeks. And they were able to diagnose the problem, solve it, and kind of stem the flow of uh, hog death in this farm. Mm-hmm. So it's basically acutely identified problems in the agricultural sector in these countries. And we provide very, very precisely defined solutions to help them out at no cost to the farmers. Again, it's it's foreign oh, aid, so grant, it comes out stuff. of our, yeah. Again, yeah. it comes out of all our yeah. It's, it's and it comes out. It's it's taxpayer funded, um, but it comes from the U.S. agency. Mm-hmm. Like so, we're we're just paying directly for it. It's not like we're billing them constantly, yeah. and it provides people an opportunity to get a leg up in countries where they wouldn't really have access to certain resources and certain knowledge bases. Gotcha. Gotcha. Sounds sounds pretty cool. So. Uh, in, in our conversations leading up to this, you had mentioned yeah. you live on the West Coast now, but you're keeping East Coast work hours, right? right? Yeah. So kind of, this is kind of more of like a, a remote work type question. It's like, how do you work out this schedule? Um, and do you have any tips for people working at home? Because I know, I mean, with this pandemic, not only is it going to be now, but a lot of companies are seeing the benefits of maybe not bringing in everybody all the time or more remote work. So what kind of what have you you gotten learned from this process and tips you could provide? 
That's a good, that's a really good question. Uh, and I get, I can't, I have to caveat this with, uh, I'm definitely not everybody in a sense that I really like being alone when I work. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, not collaborative, but I do. I You're love like my face. <laughs> yeah. Right. I value, um, kind of being closer to my family here on the West coast. And mm-hmm. I value kind of, we live in, you know, kind of a rural area in Southwestern Washington. Gotcha. Uh, I value that a lot. Uh, a lot but it's also um, I've also I was in DC for two years working okay. in an office so I think the remote work the key is to provide yourself enough time in which you're actually associating in person with the people you work with and I know some people have a completely remote decentralized workforce and that's great um, but I'd say if this if you're someone who is really interested in um, working remotely full time I don't know if there's if companies are there quite yet or organizations yeah. are there quite yet. I mean, I'd say the DC based NGOs are about as forward thinking as it gets in that mm-hmm. department. With that said, I mean, maybe outside the San Francisco tech sector, but with that said, I, I think if you, you want to go to DC, kind of pay your dues a little bit, understand that like this, you should work gain you know, experience in the city, understand the feel of it, get, you know, grow your relationships and then see if it's something that you can do remotely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, you know, I'm still slated to go back uh, every quarter to visit the DC gotcha. office and that's perfectly fine. And I, I do travel quite a, when it's not a pandemic, I am mm-hmm. traveling a lot for work as well. So I'm constantly going around visiting these different country offices. Um, so it's something it, it's a job that keeps you on the move i mean it's so sedentary with the pandemic right now but yeah. usually it's not this uh, it's not this isolated yeah uh, but i would say um, if i'm giving advice to somebody who wants to work remotely it really depends on what you want to do um in the city if, if you like the city i'm much more uh, like i prefer rural areas uh, mm-hmm. and if i could do a remote job i will uh, but some people tend to like living in cities and urban areas. So uh, if that's something you're, you know, don't don't get married to the idea of remote work because it doesn't uh, it doesn't break the same for everybody. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, finding a place with a, a flexible policy, but that actually allows you to be there physically um, mm-hmm. would probably be a good place to start, especially right out of school. I don't think you want to be a, a new a new graduate you know, that's in a completely decentralized workplace and you have, yeah. you're, you're, you're early isolated once you graduate and you just have that diploma and all these job applications. Mm-hmm. Um, you might want to be in a specific place and making those relationships in person for a while. Yeah, no, I think, I think that's a good, good point of, of getting acclimated with, with the company or organization and stuff. Right. And I think, you know, the GSMA and IBL students are kind of uniquely positioned for that, given the fact that we're, you know, it's effectively, you know, there's not going to be a lot of like driving of ships or anything like that, or, you know, turn or being in an engine room. So mm-hmm. it's, it's something that it, it's a rare question at CMA, but I appreciate you bringing that up for a, a pretty large subset of the students. Yeah, I mean, well, I, and our IBL GSMA oceanography students, there they won't be here on campus the whole semester. Or the whole year, wow. I, mean, I should say, yeah. Oh, so, really? yeah. So, I mean, they're getting a crash course kind of in, uh, in the remote work, and then I think kind of what you touched on, thinking of specifically like transfers and freshmen who started in fall twenty twenty, like they're actually doing the thing that you're like not the best, and in talking with them, they, you know, I, multiple ones have expressed that kind of, you know, I'm part of Cal Maritime, but I don't really know anybody. And, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to meet them over video conference over and over and over again. It just does not work in the same way. So yeah, totally. Right. And I think you miss some, some, I think they're sometimes missing the cultural benefits of Cal Maritime too. I mean, I think what I wanted to say this when I was writing down notes before this, but I think specifically, if you want to get into something like the Peace Corps, where you have so much autonomy uh, and you're, you know, my, my boss and the Peace Corps was like 300 miles away and never checked in on me. Uh, it helps to have gone to a school like Cal Maritime because it does kind of ingrain a certain level of self-discipline in you. We're not, not in a militaristic way, but in a, in a little bit that way. I mean, and it's I pseudo, the, def- yeah, definitely. Draws it's pseudo it. military. Yeah. So I think that or quasi military. And I think that little bit of self-discipline you get really does kind of trickle into your first job and you do tend to appear more mature and in a job at like Peace Corps where it's you have just the the tethers cut and you're out there in a community it does help you manage yourself a little bit better so I'd say maritime graduates are uniquely positioned for jobs like that Mm -hmm. so you know I just as long as they're getting hopefully they're be able to return to campus at some point and kind of gain that that you know it's looking like the fall um 
At least that, that, I mean, that's the plan. I know that's a plan for a lot of people. Yeah, exactly. Fingers crossed. Yeah, right. no, yeah. Nobody's making any promises at this point uh, mm -hmm. at all. So kind of, and then now just kind of broad, broad scope for you. So you've had a pretty big international flavor uh, for, to your experiences. So working in Guatemala, I know you did a study, study abroad year in Barcelona. Yeah. Um, and now you're working, you know, supporting work in Latin American countries the Caribbean, Myanmar. So what drew you to pursuing such an international focus in both school and work? Right. That's a good question. Uh, I, okay. So I, I should probably have that. So the, the study abroad was actually through Cal Maritime. It was okay. actually the, um, it was the, the, the required uh, abroad trip that they started. The is that still experience? a requirement? Yeah. Is that still a requirement? Uh, okay. uh, yes. With, uh, with the caveat that last summer and this summer, obviously they're not sending students uh, abroad, but right. in a typical time, yeah, they'll be going, going abroad for a okay. couple of weeks and stuff. Yeah. So I think what, what gave me the, the international spin was one learning that it was possible, but I think the, the linchpin of this whole thing was uh, the fact that my international experience had a language requirement that I'll, I will forever appreciate. It was a pain in the butt, but I will forever mm -hmm. appreciate that, that the Spanish professor at the time actually said, you need to pass this course, you know, and speak this level and we can go and communicate. And I think it was a much more fruitful experience for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, what I'm finding is that the, the, the kind of drilling down is the ability to learn a second language was what kind of led me to realize, oh, I can, maybe this international thing works. Like mm -hmm. just one other language really opened a lot of doors for gotcha. me. It's the reason I got sent to Peace Corps Guatemala. Uh, it's the reason I work at an NGO that deals with Latin America and the Caribbean specifically. Um, you know, half my day is spent speaking Spanish at work as mm -hmm. opposed to, you know, Spanish and English mix. Um, and occasionally I pick up on the Portuguese happening around me. Yeah. Um, but I'd say that that's what led me to the international side of things. Um, Again, we're international business, you know, and global studies students. Uh, I think there should be that kind of focus, or at least that that broad understanding. Maybe I took that like far too literally uh, when I was at <laughs> I just I had assumed like, international business, right, so we can work abroad, right? We can work yep. with other countries. Like that's mm -hmm. how it's supposed to go. Uh, so I just didn't. I never let go of that. I became gotcha. very. I think the terms xenophilic. Um, mm -hmm. Not to tread too lightly on a word that's yeah a, a word that's not great these days, but it's something yeah. that just kind of attracted me to other cultures. Um, I'm not you know I'm I'm not particularly like cultured you know coming from a super cultured background of mm -hmm. raised in a suburb in Sacramento. It just yeah. you know you you're able to appeal to your interest and Cal Maritime enabled that for me. Um, so I'd say you know if students are interested in international careers, I'd say do everything you can. The, the mm -hmm. lowest hanging fruit is to learn a language, especially if you're a full-time student, you have all the time in the world to learn these things. As, as if you're gonna be in the, I, I, I don't wanna you know, um, guess what the student, the deck and engine students are going through, they may not actually have time to do that. But I'd mm -hmm. say if you're, if global or international is gonna be on your diploma at some point in time, you should probably do everything you can. Uh, to learn a second language it was it's not easy like i'm not going to say it was the easiest task we've ever done but it was mm -hmm. it's by far the most rewarding and most door opening thing you can do mm -hmm. upon graduating um short of you know learning how to code in a bunch of different languages yeah yeah no i i will say uh i remember high school spanish and i was not uh not the <laughs> not the best student and so i'm i mean i can spot words here and there but it's like yeah. i now i'm like i wish that i had uh had take had paid more attention right. and um, and I also get mad at my dad for not teaching me Spanish too so I'll, I'll blame it on him. <laughs> so so just in case students feel like they're they can't be saved from that particular thing, I almost failed high school Spanish. So mm -hmm. I, it, it it can happen for you. Yeah, you just have to get serious about it at some yeah, point. And, and so, was, and, yeah, and that was yeah, that was like I, my I thing is like learner. I wasn't serious yeah. in yeah. high school. You know, in high school, it's like right. I'm not going to yeah. put in extra time to learn it and. And as we grow older, we realize that there's like certain things like, man, I really would like to, and whether it be college or your early twenties or, or whatever, you start to, you know, maybe have a little bit different focus for sure. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But yeah, it's, it's doable, but yeah, students, uh, go learn, go learn your second language. Yep. Good yep. So, uh, now, you know, you're, you've, you've done quite a few jobs and stuff. So how, how have you seen Cal Maritime prepare you for your career path and in the various jobs you've held? Okay, um, good. So I'll, I'll touch on the what I had said again about that. The one, it was the kind of level of self-discipline for going into something like the Peace Corps, um, going into like something that's, 
where you, you get a lot of autonomy, you get you don't have a lot of uh, restrictions right out of the gate, but you have some decisions that you have to make in something like the Peace Corps or something like international aid work that the consequences can be pretty, uh, pretty serious, right? We had pretty significant restrictions on where we could travel in Guatemala uh, for safety reasons. Uh, and we had incidents in which people who were not abiding by those were accosted or we did have things happen that, that went really poorly for volunteers. Uh, and I'd say it, you get a lot of that out of your system quickly at counter time, at least to an extent, yeah. you know, everyone's, it's still a college. So <laughs> people- <laughs> Can't take it all the way out of them. <laughs> you're, exactly, right. You can't, um, so, but I think, you know, I was a young volunteer in my group. I was 22 and I was, I was well below the average age of the volunteers in my group, but I was able to kind of act like a peer. And I, I would attribute mm -hmm. that to California, or Cal Maritime. One, you have a lot of you know non-traditional students around. Some of my best friends were in their late twenties and thirties, and so on. They didn't really have time for a twenty-one-year-old <laughs> to act like a twenty-one-year-old. So yeah, maybe you grow up, up to a our level, quicker. kid. Right, right, right. <laughs> so maybe you grow up a little quicker at Cal Maritime, uh, and that that puts you in a good position moving forward. Uh, second, I guess I would say the, the it's a unique school in that it jumps out at you, but your, your, your curriculum is still really customizable. I mean, your classes are so small. If there's something you're really interested in pursuing, tell your teachers this. I will never, you know, I'll never forget. I think, uh, you know, Dr. I think Dr. Kamdar is still there, right? And then Dr. Bakar, is he still teaching there yep. as well? Both of them. Right, they, they both let me really explore, you know, through the lens of the supply chain management classes that Dr. Bakar teaches or Dr. Kamdar's economics courses. Like, you know, I was able to explore, you know, the aquaculture fishery side of things. They would sit and talk to me about this stuff and let me pursue my interests. And it ended up, you know, my co-op was actually with a seafood company in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. And it was because I was able to learn a little bit of language on my own and do my projects and be a little more, uh, and be in, and, and force myself to stand out, uh, to kind of tailor, you know, my career, tailor my, you know, my experiences to what I wanted to work in eventually. So again, the class size is an advantage. Use that to your advantage. Go to your teacher's office hours. We're not a research unit. It's not a research university. The teachers are preoccupied with the students primarily and teaching the students. And so leverage that. Don't, you know, if you have something that's burning, you're interested in or a burning question, you feel it might relate to one of your classes, you talk to your professors about it. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. You know, and then third, uh, how Cal Maritime prepared me for this. I mean, I think it like, prevented a lot of sunburn later because I had this sweet hat. <laughs> no, this thing, got I it. can't you tell you this thing has been through a lot. Um, I could tell. So, you know, yeah. I think my skin looks great because of that bill that I had <laughs> to have on outside uh, constantly. Yeah. Um, but I, 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 it's a bit just about some, I mean, Keller, it, again, it's just such a, it's the, the small, the size of the school, being able mm -hmm. to know everybody, developing community. It's just, I don't know, something I won't, I'll, I don't think people can relate to that my yeah. friends and you know my loved ones that went to large universities mm -hmm. so the ability of one you know being able to form these tight communities but also cal maritime is a pretty uh, diverse school in terms of the ideology of the students um so just in terms of surviving in this day and age i think cal yeah. maritime is a pretty you know there's a lot of diverse politics and opinions and ideologies at the school i think it made me one a, a kind of a professed granola from california pretty uh amicable to hearing mm -hmm. diverse viewpoints so i think hopefully you know my understanding is that california Cal maritime students if i you know run that up the chain are probably going to do really well in this day and age in terms of being accepting of others and listening yeah. to opposing viewpoints and things like that and that's so necessary in the workforce um, especially in something like international development where you know international politics do come into play and how you view things and you design projects are informed by your opinions about the world and your understanding of economics and politics and international relations. I mean, so being open to these things makes you much mm -hmm. more well-rounded. Totally. And I think Cal Maritime prepared me for that. I heard a lot of opinions I didn't like at Cal Maritime mm -hmm. and I told a lot of people opinions mm -hmm. they didn't like at Cal Maritime mm -hmm. and they're still, they were good friends of mine the entire time. So yeah. I think that's, that's what I, I won't forget about the school. And it's something I think I have an advantage in just, you know, general discourse these days. Mm -hmm. Definitely, definitely. Uh, you 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 know you mentioned earlier a little bit about getting back into your masters and or going yeah. back and pursuing your masters. So yeah. just wanted to touch on that uh, quickly. Like after a couple of years of work, what kind of kind of spurred that on? About I'm going back to school now. 
Right. And it, this isn't for everybody. Like you can get, you can start working international development, you know, if you've done the something like the Peace Corps. The Peace Corps is kind of the, uh, it's not so much Peace Corps itself, but it's field work. It's mm -hmm. being in a country, understanding the realities on the ground um, in, a, <clears throat> in a developing or an impoverished context. That's what it is. Peace Corps is the best way to do that, in my opinion, in a sense that it's not, it's for the willing. It's not always for the most highly qualified. I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a particularly like stellar student, my GPA or anything like that. So, but it does provide unique experiences. Um, so I'd say, oh man, I lost, I lost my train of thought a little bit, but in terms of going back to graduate school. So after the, after the Peace Corps is over, um, I just kind of decided that it switched my trajectory so much and I was really hungry to learn something, right? Gotcha. Um, and learning something in a sense that like, I didn't believe I, I knew what, I didn't know the right answers for how mm -hmm. to go about international global development. I didn't know enough about aquaculture, things like that. Uh, so uh, the best way to do that was to go back to graduate school. Um, but transitioning into something like that, which was pretty engineering, STEM, economics, calculus heavy, is not always the easiest thing to do. It, it's not always the easiest sell if you've come out of a global studies or business background. Uh, we took one calculus course uh, in the business program at Cal Maritime, and I'll always be thankful for that. But uh, in terms of learning these things, it helped. It's doing something like the Peace Corps really helps you make a compelling case for yourself as committed to these things. Um, because I, I didn't really, I didn't have particularly high GRE scores either. Mm -hmm. um, but it's that idea that you have to sell, you know, selling yourself by committing to something like the Peace Corps or teaching English abroad or just going abroad to work or being willing to do something, uh, schools will tend to take more of a chance on you. Yeah. But uh, you have to you have to fill that that early resume up. You have to do something that you know jumps off the page at people. Um, and some for some people that's Peace Corps, for some people that's Fulbright. Uh, I wouldn't I wouldn't recommend going straight into graduate school. Uh, right after you're, you're talking undergrad. to someone that didn't either I, I took a couple yeah. years off before I went and got my master's right. so yeah right and it's a it's a good it's a good idea it just kind of helps you understand the world around you uh, I do work with people who went straight into their master's program mm -hmm. right after undergrad they're highly highly intelligent but sometimes uh, they do tend to miss things uh, they maybe not a misunderstanding of the realities of a workplace or an agricultural mm -hmm. value chain. Uh, you know, they have the language right. They have their, their impeccable writers and yep. fast readers. Uh, but sometimes people tend to miss things uh, if they haven't worked on the ground. Mm -hmm. So I'd attribute that to, you know, working with your hands and in, in the communities with people. Um, if you want to work in international business, I still think something like Peace Corps helps. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just an understanding of the content of someone else's context. Um, and that, then that means like something like AmeriCorps, if you want to do it domestically too, uh, that's also perfectly fine. I mean, it's just, it's a great route for students who are interested in public service, uh, for whom the military might not be, uh, their number one option. Um, but something that is, is service minded, um, and it's, uh, it really can catapult you into, you know, the career you want, uh, not everyone. I'm, I'm one of two people who still do international development for my 30 person Peace Corps cohort. Gotcha. Um, Cause I viewed it as an entry level job, international development. Other mm -hmm. people are attorneys and doctors and I mean, it's a pretty high achieving bunch, but if you want to get into the international game, I think finding a, a path that doesn't offer a lot of resistance, but forces you to be resilient once you're there, like Peace Corps is mm -hmm. definitely a, a good option for maritime students. Gotcha. Got you. So kind of, again, and this is kind of a theme with, with you and your interview is that you've done so much. So what, what skills have you found that you utilize in all of your jobs or even most of your jobs, you know, those transferable skills that people are always talking about? Sure. Um, I mean, I, I can't harp on this enough language. Again, like if you do the math, you know, speaking English allows you to talk to, you know, X you know, 100 million, maybe a billion people in the world, you add, I think, 700 million people to that if you learn Spanish. It's just, it's just like, it just opens your network mm -hmm. uh, enormously. So language is the one thing. Um, thinking about supply chains has been hugely important. I have a couple projects I've helped on uh, is value chain development. So right now we have a project in Colombia that is dealing with uh, enhancing kind of the cacao sector, right? Or chocolate or mm -hmm. un, 
sorry, agriculture terms, cacao <laughs> is raw chocolate, everyone. Um, so enhancing that sector, but thinking, taking a supply chain or a whole value chain approach, understanding terms like vertical integration and the bullwhip effect and all these supply chain logistics terms and understanding information flows uh, have given me a leg up or have late, at least made me a much more contributive member of the team when discussing how we plan projects and you can mm -hmm. win these massive awards, but then you have to implement them. <laughs> yeah. and understanding how to talk about this from a supply chain level, especially for business students is really important. Knowing, you know, being able to describe something is good, but having the right vocabulary for it gets you to that point much more quickly when writing or trying to convey a point. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that, I mean, that specifically from my degree uh, has set me apart in my, in my workspace, understanding uh, just supply chain management. Gotcha. Uh, on, at least at a bachelor's level. I mean, there's people that know more, more, far more about it than me, but it is mm -hmm. applicable. Yeah. Um, getting something from A to B is not a, is a problem that is, you know, is a global issue. And there's always, there are always people trying to optimize that. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. our it's, it's, are good for that. Yeah. yeah it's not quite a straight line. <laughs> Even right. It's just it, it, <laughs> exactly. It never is. The, the only difference is between, you know, supply chain management, what I was doing at school and now is I have to focus on growing something for six months before we ship it somewhere. Yep. So yep. that's the, that's the only addition definitely. to what I'm doing. Definitely. Uh, we, we definitely have cadets kind of interested in, in similar past, like with NGO and stuff that, that you've done. So how did you go about getting your jobs with both the Research Innovation Fellowship for Agriculture and Partners of the Americas? Sure. So the the REFA Research Innovation Fellowship in Agriculture is actually something that was specifically for graduate students. Okay. Um, so I would say the uh, the better example of what I did about how I went about getting my jobs was uh, working uh, for the I think there's a I worked for an NG or a business called Clean Fish, uh, okay. which was my my co-op that I did with when I was still a student at Cal Maritime. That was a load of cold calling and cold emailing and saying hey you guys do international you know you're they're like basically international seafood wholesaler that i thought was fascinating i love their sustainability statements all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. that gets you know like young californians <laughs> interested yeah, the, um, yeah. The, the, the ideologues when you're you got I, mean, this yeah, so cool. yeah. I was 20 years old i saw the word sustainability i applied you know mm -hmm. um so obviously that's uh that plot's thickened a little bit but i think just cold emailing. I got my job from with Partners of the Americas because I was part of a, a, Peace, a Peace Corps jobs Facebook group. So it's about the network that you gain. Um, but I'd say don't be afraid to reach out if you don't have a lot of experience. You know, the worst thing people are going to, I know this is so cliche, but like the really the worst thing people can say is no. You Total, can, it's so true though. It's so right. True. Right. But if you have an industry you're super interested in and you can tailor your projects and your experience at Cal Maritime towards that industry, and it could be anything. If you're interested in food and beverages, if you're interested in cold chain supply chain stuff, if you're interested in, I don't know, becoming a cattle rancher, it doesn't matter. Right. <clears throat> if you can if you can tailor your education at Cal Maritime towards that and there is some leeway there, if you just express enough interest towards your teachers and then you start cold calling those people and saying, hey, I will do that I will work you know I will be an intern I will do what mm -hmm. you need to do um when I was working for clean fish I was working at side job so you know there's we can get into the the ethics of paying interns because I yeah. definitely feel strongly I feel very strongly about part of that but mm -hmm. I think I think you just have to start asking people building your network like the, 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 it's so amazing how quickly you can build a network mm -hmm. it's just by emailing somebody look can I get on this list serve uh, yeah. I really want to you know, learn about how to do this. Um, the international development sphere is full of really nice people <laughs> that are willing to, you know, take somebody on and train them. Um, mm -hmm. Students feel free, they can feel free to reach out to me. I can try and put them in contact with something or tell them who to call or who to talk to or which route to go through. Um, you know, Washington DC seemed like such a big scary enigma when I was, you know, in, at, and I never thought I'd live there or be mm -hmm. working there, um, much less on like, you know, really near the white house you know it's just like yeah. kind of the feel of it all and it seems so scary and then you get there and it's just a bunch of normal people in an office mm -hmm. doing work that they really love but i'd say you know if you want to if this if there's something you really want to do advocate for it and start advocating for it at cal maritime become the person who's interested in that mm -hmm. right and uh you, you know your your cohorts are so small it's not hard to stand out as that person totally Totally. Cool. Well, that, that's all the questions that I have. Any closing thoughts um, or advice to, to kind of wrap it up? 
Yeah, no, just hang in there, everybody, with the with the pandemic. Yeah. I know this is brutal. I've been at home for you know more from home for a year now. Uh, it hopefully it gets better for everybody. Um, and just no, I just wish all the students well. And again, feel free to read. I'm sure my email will be provided in the mm -hmm. little follow up to this. So feel free to reach out if you have any questions. I'm pretty. Uh, I get off. You know, my my time is East Coast hours, so I have my afternoons if people ever want to chat. So no, cool. thanks for thanks for taking the time, Ryan. This is fun. Yeah, totally, Colin. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And yeah, we'll link his LinkedIn and his email in the show notes and everything, so you guys can uh, check it out and uh, reach out to Colin. But thanks, Colin, very much. Yeah, no problem. Take care, everyone. Bye.